Good day all and welcome to class. This time we'll be looking at chemistry and important questions or relevant questions that students writing Jam 23 would be expecting to see in their exam. So I'll be running through the series of 20 striking questions in chemistry. So if you aim at scoring uh, very high in your chemistry, uh, you should follow up this series and understand concepts that are associated with uh, questions, likely questions that you see in your exam. So on the board, we are having first 10. So what we are done with the first 10, then I'll rub up the board and then write the other 10. There are about 20 of them. Looking at the first question, let's not waste much time. Which of the following is not a process of halogenation of alkenes? Which of the following is not a process of halogenation of alkenes? Now, um, this is coming from organic chemistry. They are talking about the organic chemistry one. You know that uh, hydrocarbons, all of them happen to be organic compounds. And hydrocarbons is considered to be the uh, root of organic chemistry. Now, we have two divisions of hydrocarbons. We have the aliphatic and the aromatic. The aliphatic are considered to be open chain hydrocarbons while the aromatic are considered to be close chain hydrocarbons. For the aliphatic, we have about three uh, divisions under the acyclic of aliphatic. Talking about the alkenes, the alkenes, the alkenes, and the alkynes. Now, amongst the three of them, um, alkenes, they are saturated. Then alkenes and alkynes are unsaturated. All right. So looking at the alkenes, the alkenes are known to carry out chemical reactions, and of which there are two chemical reactions that alkenes undergo. And what are the two chemical reactions? The first is combustion. So we have combustion reaction, and the second is substitution reaction. So if you are asked in probably another question that what chemical reaction is peculiar to the alkenes is actually substitution. Then the chemical reaction that is common to all organic compounds is combustion. All right? And when alkenes undergo substitution reaction, there are diverse substitution reactions of alkenes, of which at this whole level, the one that is of utmost relevance is halogenation. Halogenation. And looking at halogenation reaction, it involves the um, the replacement of H, that's hydrogen, of members of the alkenes with halogens. And of course, we know what the halogens are. They are the salt formers, the group 7 elements. And classical examples of group 7 elements include fluorine, chlorine, bromine, iodine, astatine. But then again, alkenes do not undergo halogenation with fluorine and halogenation with astatine. And what are the reasons? Now, for fluorine, fluorine happens to be the most reactive elements in the world of chemistry. So due to the reactivity of fluorine, uh, alkenes do not undergo halogenation with fluorine. Therefore, astatine, astatine is considered to be radioactive, so hence, alkenes would not undergo a um, chemical reaction with astatine. Because of the fact that astatine being radioactive uh, does not undergo chemical reactions. The only under, radioactive elements only undergo special type of reactions called um, nuclear reactions. Because for radioactive elements, they are often known to be characterized by unstable nuclei, meaning that their nucleus tends to easily disintegrate, thus releasing radiations. So it's not their electrons that are actively involved in their chemical reactions. Rather, it's actually um, their protons and their neutrons that constitute the nucleus of such elements. So it means for radioactive elements, they are not involved in chemical reactions, they are involved in nuclear reactions, and the particles of atom that are involved in nuclear reactions often now, we have protons and neutrons. So they can carry out halogenation with chlorine, bromine, and iodine. All right? So uh, the best option in this case that is not halogenation should be isolation. All right? So the answer is A, the one that is not halogenation. Remember, halogenation simply is the addition of halogen. Chlorination is addition of chlorine. Bromination, addition of bromine, then iodination, addition of iodine. Let's move on to the next question. Question two. What is the product formed at the cathode in the electrolysis of aqueous 
Na2SO4, that is sodium sulfate. Now, this question is coming from electrolysis. When you electrolyze aqueous, aqueous Na2SO4, by aqueous, it means that there is water content in it. So it means that you are having Na2SO4 and H2O. So during the electrolysis, this one will ionize and then becomes Na plus and SO4 2 minus. Then what water we ionize to form H plus and OH minus. Then during electrolysis, uh, you ought to know that there are terms associated with electrolysis. One of the terms happens to be electrodes. And what are electrodes? Simply put it this way that electrodes are materials in the form of wires, rods, or plates in which current enters or leaves the electrolyte. And we have two kinds of electrodes. We have the one that is positively charged and then we have the one that is negatively charged. So the positively charged electrode is called the anode. Then while the negatively charged electrode is called the cathode. All right? So, let's say you have a beaker or a trough here, and then these are the ions that are present in the beaker or the trough. Now, if I happen to shut the key, maybe somewhere around there is where you have the key, because in a complete setup you have the battery source, you have the key, so when you shut it, the law of electromagnetism or electrostatics will be obeyed in that unlike charges will do what? Attract. The wild light charges repel. So it means these two positively charged ions will migrate to the negatively charged electrode being the cathode, that's Na plus and H plus here. Then while SO4 2 minus and OH minus will migrate to the anode based on the fact that they are negatively charged ions. So during the discharge of ions in electrolysis, the ions that are preferentially discharged or removed from the trough during electrolysis are the ones that are often lower in the ECS. And considering the ECS, um, between sodium ion and hydrogen ion, the one that is lower in the ECS is hydrogen ion. So hydrogen ion will be discharged. Then, of course, between SO4, 2 minus, and OH minus, the one that will be discharged will be OH minus, because this one is lower than this in the ECS. You have to understand your activity series very well, learn it, and know those different ions that are represented in the cation series and in the anion series. And the gas that is often associated with the discharge of this hydrogen ion is hydrogen gas. I want to leave the details of that. Then while the gas that is often associated with this one is oxygen gas. All right? So the answer to that question is, they said the product acts the cathode. So we are only interested in the cathode. So the product that you possibly get at the cathode is hydrogen gas. So the answer is C. Question 3. The scientist whose work explained the concept of isotopy. Isotopy is, first and foremost, let's get to understand what isotopy is. What is isotopy? It's simply a phenomenon in which an element exists by having differences in its mass numbers, but having the same atomic or proton number. All right, so that's isotopy. And the reason why isotopy exists is because of differences in the number of neutrons of elements. For example, what are the isotopes of carbon? We have carbon 12, we have carbon 13, we have carbon 14. These are isotopes of carbon, the same element, having the same proton or atomic number, but having different uh, mass numbers. So the reason why isotopy exists is because of the differences in the number of neutrons of elements. And of course, in this case, 12 minus 6 is 6, 13 minus 6 is 7, 14 minus 6 is 8. So looking at that, you ought to know that since these particular elements have differences in the number of neutrons, that's the reason why you have the existence of isotopy. So the scientists that will be, um, you know, a great contributor to isotopy is actually the person that discovered neutron. And the person that discovered neutron was James Chadwick. So the answer is A, James Chadwick. He discovered neutrons by simply bombarding uh, beryllium sheets with alpha particles. 
And then I think in the year 1932 was when he discovered neutrons. He said that neutrons are actually particles that are without charge, and then they are situated in the, in the nucleus of an atom. That was really exposed by N.S. Rutherford, because N.S. Rutherford was the one that discovered proton, all right? And while these two men, they worked extensively in the atomic model, all right? So that's, that's about that. Let's quickly look at the next question. The next question. Question four. A metal ozer that is amphoteric. The word amphoteric is the key word there. Amphoteric. A metal ozer that is amphoteric is, and we are giving options, now, what are amphoteric oxides? Simply put, amphoteric oxides are simply oxides that possess both acidic and basic features or properties. All right? So they possess both acidic and basic properties. So they can behave as acids and can also behave as these. And they are unique metals that are able to form these amphoteric oxides. And what are some of them? We have zinc, we have tin, we have lead, we have aluminium, and then we also have beryllium. Now these are unique metals that form amphoteric oxide. So it means that zinc oxide, tin oxide, lead oxide, aluminium oxide, beryllium oxide, all of them are amphoteric oxides. All right? So um, talking about other kinds of oxides, we have um, acid oxides, also called acid anhydrides. They are simply oxides of non-metals. Classical examples of acid oxides include CO2, NO2, um, SO2. All these are oxides of non-metals. Of course, carbon, nitrogen, and sulfur, they are non-metals. So they are acid oxides. You can call them acid oxides or acid anhydrides. Acid anhydrides. Meaning that when they dissolve in water, they form acids. You can visit my, my lessons on uh, acids in the previous videos. You get to understand that better. They want to talk about uh, basic oxides. We are referring to oxides of metals. So classical examples include sodium oxide, potassium oxide, calcium oxide, and the rest of them, even magnesium oxide. Those are simply oxides of metals and they form basic oxides. So they are basic oxides. All right? Then for that of the amphoteric, I've already explained that. Then we also have neutral oxides. Now, neutral oxides, they are simply oxides that neither possess acidic nor basic properties. Classical examples include we have CO, that's carbon 2 oxide. And we also have dinitrogen 1 oxide, which is commonly known as laughing gas. Laughing gas. All right? So, um, all these are simply, even water, water, H2O. H2O happens to be a neutral oxide. You know, pure water has a pH of seven and on the psk seven reads neutrality so that's what it means so those are um neutral oxides then we also have peroxide now we have hydrogen peroxide we have sodium peroxide now how do you know peroxide now the oxidation state of oxygen in peroxide happens to be minus one normally the oxidation state of oxygen in most compounds is minus two but in the case of peroxide it happens to be minus one so let's check the options a metal oxide that is amphoteric is, of course, I told you that these are the unique metals that form it zinc, tin, lead, aluminum, and beryllium. So the answer is A, zinc oxide. The others, this one is basic oxide, basic oxide, while this one is neutral. Remember, I've already explained that. Then, number five, law which relates pressure and volume of a gas is, what are they asking you? I've not treated on the gas laws in my previous videos. Now, the gas law that relates volume and pressure is obvious is Boyle's law. Because from Boyle's law, it states that the volume of a given or fixed mass of gas is inversely proportional to its pressure, meaning volume and pressure they are mentioned. Then, provided the temperature remains constant. So, it means temperature is of no relevance in Boyle's law. That is the only law that relates pressure and volume. So, the answer is D. Then, question six. The bond in CO2 the bond in CO2, that's carbon 4 oxide, is... Now, looking at chemical bonding, we have different kinds of bonds. Generally, bonds are split into two parts. We have the intramolecular bonds, intramolecular bonds, and then we have the intermolecular bonds. So we have intramolecular bonds and intermolecular bonds. 
Now, intramolecular bonds are bonds that exist within molecules. That's the key word, within molecules. Then while intermolecular bonds are bonds that exist between molecules, between molecules, all right? So looking at the bonds under the intra, we have the first to be electrovalent. So we have electrovalent bond. Electrovalent bond is also called ionic bond. That's another name for electrovalent. Then we have covalent, covalent bond. And then we have metallic bond, metallic bond. All right? And then under the intermolecular bonds, we have hydrogen bond, hydrogen bond. We have a Van der Waals force. These are classical examples of intermolecular bonds. They're looking at this. Our main focus is on this intra. Now, the bond that exists in CO2, CO2, it's obvious that it's actually covalent bond. Why? Because covalent bond are bonds that are usually present in molecules that are held when you have um, non metals together coexisting. When non metals coexist, together. The, the kind of bond that is existing within them is actually covalent bond. So when you have a metal and non-metal, that's electrovalent. So if I have NaCl, this is electrovalent. NaOH, metal non-metals, electrovalent. Then non-metals coexisting, covalent. Then looking at uh, the options here, the options, A is electrovalent bond, B, covalent bond, C, hydrogen bond, then D, coordinate covalent bond. It can never be coordinate covalent bond because this type of bond, though it's a kind of covalent bond, but it's only present in, uh, in complex ions, talking about radicals. So where you can actually find this coordinate covalent bond, classical um, radicals that possess coordinate covalent bonds are hydronium ion, H3O plus, and ammonium ion, NH4 plus. Another name for coordinate covalent bond is called dative, dative bond. So the answer to this question is uh, covalent bond. The next. Alkynes are dashed in water and the melting point dash with increase in molar, in molar mass. Now, alkynes, first and foremost, we are aware that alkynes, they are organic compounds. Yes. So based on the fact that they are organic compounds, they won't dissolve in water. Because remember that likes dissolve likes, meaning inorganic solvent dissolve inorganic solutes. Why organic solvent dissolve organic solutes, all right? And then um, based on that, then we can actually say that alkynes they are insoluble in water because water happens to be an inorganic solvent. Why alkynes are organic compounds, all right? So the first is that they are insoluble. This one is insoluble in water. That's the first. And again, they said the, the melting point dash with increase in, in molar mass. In the lessons of organic chemistry. When there is an increase, increase in molar mass, it indicates increase in melting points. In melting points, it also indicates increase in boiling points, and it also indicates increase in density. Yes. So whenever there is an increase in molar mass, it increases melting point, boiling point, and density. And vice versa, meaning if you decrease molar mass, there will be decrease in melting point, boiling point, and density. So the answer to the question is that it tends to what? To increase with increase. So this is also increase. Because now the melting point will increase with increase in molar mass. And the melting point will decrease with decrease in molar mass. You get the point? So the answer is insoluble and increase. So here do we have that, that's B, insoluble and increase. So that's our answer. Then question eight. A reagent that can be used to distinguish amongst the three classes of alkanols is... Now when we talk about classes of alkanols, the classes they are referring to here are, we have primary, primary alkanols. We have secondary, secondary alkanols. And we have tertiary, tertiary alkanols. Okay? So now, when we say primary alkanols, we are simply referring to alkanols whose carbon that is carrying the OH is only linked or connected to just one other carbon. For example, this carbon is carrying OH, it should just be connected to just only one other carbon. 
So in this case, you can call this a primary alkanol. But a situation where you have something like this, meaning that the carbon bearing the OH is linked or connected to two other carbon atoms, then you call this secondary. Look at this. This is the carbon carrying the OH, and it's only connected to just one carbon. But in this case, this is the carbon bearing the OH. It's connected directly to two others. This is secondary. This is primary. Then we now have something like this. The carbon that is bearing the OH is connected to three other carbon atoms. So when you have the carbon bearing the OH connected to three other carbon atoms, then you can now see that this is um, tertiary. So you see the carbon that is bearing the OH. How many carbons are directly linked to it? One, two, three. So this is tertiary. This is primary. And this is secondary. All right? So now they are asking for the test that can be used to distinguish amongst the three of them. Now, the reagent that, are, that is needed to distinguish among the three of them is called the Lucas reagent. Lucas reagent. All right? Lucas reagent. And the answer is obvious that the answer is actually um, A, Lucas reagent. And what makes up Lucas reagent? Lucas reagent is simply made up of anhydrous, anhydrous zinc chloride in concentrated hydrochloric acid. So that's the makeup of that Lucas reagent. And this is what happens. When you, when you mix tertiary alkanol with Lucas reagent, it produces an immediate cloudiness or cloudy nature of that of the solution, meaning that there will be turbidity of the solution immediate to be very fast. But in the case of the secondary alkanols, it takes about three to five minutes for the cloudiness to appear. That's for secondary. But this one is immediate. In the case of primary alkanols, it doesn't even change at all. It doesn't bring about cloudiness. It's only when you now carry out a you know, application of high temperature that can actually, application of it, that can actually produce that. So under normal condition, you won't be having any form of a turbid solution being formed when you mix primary alkanols with Lucas reagent. So like I said, again, this one is immediate. This one is about three to five minutes. Then while this one is, uh, it doesn't, under, under normal condition, you won't be having any form of cloudy or turbid solution. So the answer is, a. Then the next question, question 9. The shape of S orbital is dash. Now, this is taking us to orbital configuration, orbital representation, talking about uh, the different types of orbitals that we have. The concept of orbitals, let me just quickly throw more light on orbitals. When you hear of orbitals, they are simply regions of space where there is a high tendency of probability of finding electrons with certain amount of energy. And there are about four types of orbitals. We have the S orbital, we have the P orbital, then we have the D orbital, and we have the F orbital. All right? So these are the four types of orbitals. Now, this one has a full name. They call it sharp. So it's sharp orbital. Then while this one is principal, in some texts they will say principal. All right? Then while this one is diffuse, Diffuse, talking about their full names. The while this one is fundamental. All right? And orbitals are simply regions of space where there is a high tendency or probability of finding electrons with certain amount of energy. Now, the maximum carrying capacity of the S orbital is two electrons. The maximum of B is six. The maximum of D is 10. The while the maximum of F is 14. Then the shape of the S orbital is spherical. Spherical in shape. Then why the P orbital is dumbbell. Dumbbell. Then the D orbital is double dumbbell. Double dumbbell. Or you can simply refer to this as dome. Dome. Then why the F orbital is um, complex. It's very, very complicated in terms of its shape. All right, so it's obvious that the answer to this question is D, spherical. Then, lastly, under number 10, we are having the acid used in electrolysis of water is dilute. The answer is obvious is C. Because now, when you have studied your electrolysis concept very well, you get to know that um, the electrolysis of acidified water, the electrolysis of acidified water means electrolysis of dilute. 
tetrahydrosulfate 6 acid. All right. Then again, if you are not asked, the electrolysis of the brine is actually the electrolysis of concentrated sodium chloride. All right. So that's that about that. So we are just seeing about 10 questions. So let me just run off the board and then we'll come again. Looking at the 11th or two to the 20th uh, questions. So question 11. Which of the following processes result in a decrease in entropy? That's question 11. Looking at entropy, the word entropy is a term that tends to uh, affect a spontaneous reaction. Yes. And when we talk about spontaneous reactions, we are referring to reactions that occur naturally on the own without any external factors causing or making them happen. Now, considering entropy, entropy is simply the measure of the disorderliness. The measure of the disorderliness or randomness. The randomness of a chemical system. So, when you say that entropy is positive, it means that there is a high degree of disorderliness. But when you say it's negative, it means that there is a level of orderliness. So, please get this in straight. A positive entropy means high degree of disorderliness, while a negative entropy means a degree of orderliness. So looking at the three states of matter, gas, liquid, and solid, which one is highly orderly? It is what? Solid. Then the one that is highly disorderly is what? Gas. So if you are not asked, which one should have positive entropy? Is the gas. Why? Because this is highly disorderly. I know positive is to disorderliness. The why negative is to... Um, orderliness. So in this case, this is actually what? Having negative entropy. While this one is having positive entropy. And entropy is denoted with the letter S. Okay? So take cognizance of that. So looking at these um, options, A, the solution of salt in water is scatters. And of course, this is actually positive entropy, meaning that there is a level of disorderliness. Then desorption of gas from charcoal, release of gas from charcoal, that's actually disorderliness. Because gas is the lost space, so they tend to move in random manner. All right. So this is also what positive. The melting of wax, it is still positive because it scatters. Wax is in orderliness. Then when it melts, it tends to scatter. So that is also what positive. They're looking at uh, condensation of steam. By condensation, it means we are converting gas to liquid. And look at this. This one has the highest level of disorderliness. Then this one has the lowest level of disorderliness and highest level of orderliness. So between gas and liquid, which one should be more orderly? It is what? Liquid. So imagine you are now converting gas to liquid. There is a level of orderliness. So I can say that that is negative. So the only one with the negative entropy or a decrease in entropy is actually what? Condensation D. Next question. The criterion that is given that a given chemical reaction will occur spontaneously is given by, I gave the definition of spontaneous reactions, not quite wrong. Now, there is something you need to consider, Gibbs energy. Now, Gibbs energy is the available energy for a reaction. And this Gibbs energy is denoted with the letter G. So whenever delta G, meaning change in Gibbs energy, is equal to zero, the system is at equilibrium. Please take cognizance of this. Then whenever your delta G value is greater than zero, or you could call this positive, because any value greater than zero should be positive. That's one plus two plus three, all those are positive values. So it indicates a non-spontaneous reaction, a non-spontaneous reaction, all right? Then whenever delta G is less than zero, meaning that any value less than zero should be to the negative axis. So it is actually what negative. So whenever delta G is negative, it indicates spontaneous reaction. So it means that our answer is actually clear, that the answer is um, delta G less than zero. Because now they said the criterion that a given chemical reaction will occur spontaneously, meaning for a spontaneous reaction, your delta G must be less than zero, which invariably means negative. Next question. What is the valence share electron configuration of element with atomic number 17. You have to be very careful in this kind of question. For those of you that know your energy gradation system, that it follows a pattern that's for orbital configuration of 1s, 2s, 
2p, 3s, 3p, and it's a continuous stuff. You know, when you are moving from this direction to this direction, there's what? Increase in energy, energy level. Then here yeah, should be decrease in energy level. All right? Now, S orbital, remember, I said it takes two maximum. Then P takes six. Then now, looking at this, we said, what is the valence shear electron configuration of element with atomic number 17? So an element X with atomic number 17 would still have its electron number to be 17 because this they just they just said uh, element X or they just said atom. Looking at this now, it's not an ion. It's just an element. Check. An element, not an ion. It's not, it doesn't possess any charge. And recall that the proton number is the same as atomic number. So another name for atomic number is proton number. All right? So the proton number, which is the same as the atomic number, is equal to the electron number when an element is existing in a neutral form. But when it is with a charge, then you have to be very careful that the proton is not all, uh, equal to the electron. But in the case of a neutral atom, the proton number is the same as the electron number. So it's obvious that our electron number here still remains 17, since the proton number being the atomic number is 17, because there is no charge. Then now we are working with 17 electrons. Going by the configuration, S takes 2, so that becomes 1S2, then 2S again, 2. Then this one takes six maximum six, and we are running to what to seventeen. Then this one three s two. Then this one three p. Then five because we want to get up to seventeen. If you count everything here, the powers here, it gives you a total of seventeen. But now many students will be tempted to pick in this one, and it's in the option if you check, in the option you are having this one, which is same with this. That is the configuration, the complete configuration of an element with an atomic number of 17. But they are not interested in that. They said, what is the valence shear electron configuration? Going by shear configuration of this element, you are having K shear to take 2, L shear taking 8, then that's total of 10, so we are left with 7. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. So this is 2. 8, 7. So the outermost share here takes 7. That's what they're interested in. They said the valence. Valence share simply means outermost share. It only has 7. So it means that what you are interested in having here is the valence share of the electrons. So looking at the valence share, the electrons present there, is actually 7. So it means we are not interested in the initial electrons. What we are interested in is the outermost share electrons. And since it's 7, it counts from here. 5 plus 2, that's 7. So it means we are only interested in this configuration, while this one is irrelevant. So the answer is 3s2 and 3p5. Alright? Next question. Which of the following salts is slightly soluble in water? Which of the following salts is slightly soluble in water? If you go to the series of salts that I explained, one of my video lessons on salts, I explained about the solubility of salt. There was something I said about uh, the tetrahydrous of the six salt compounds. Those salt compounds that ends with SO4, tetrahydrous of the six salt compounds. I said that all of them are soluble salts, with the exception of three. And what are they? Calcium sulfate, which is CaSO4, then barium sulfate, which is BaSO4, and lead sulfate, being PbSO4. Then I said, Amongst these three that are insoluble tetrahydrous of a six salt compounds, the one of them that is actually slightly soluble that can dissolve sparingly or slightly in water is this. So the answer to the question is actually this. All right. Of course, uh, lead chloride, silver chloride, they are um, insoluble salts, completely insoluble salts. But this one can dissolve in hot water. Then, while well, all sodium salt compounds, this one contains sodium. So, all sodium, potassium, and ammonium salt compounds, they are actually what? Soluble salts. Please try to be, uh, visit the video lesson on solubility of salts and you understand that too, very well. So, the answer is A. Then, the next question the oxidizing agent in the reaction above, this is the reaction. So, let's quickly deal with that. The oxidizing agent in the reaction above, so this is H2O. Then gas plus C S that's carbon to give H2, then um, C 
O. Of course, the whole of this is called water gas. If you have read your um, carbon and its compound, talking about the gasification of poop, this component makes up water gas, all right? So let's leave the details of that. Now, looking at this reaction very well, they are asking us about the oxidizing agent of the reaction. Usually, please be very attentive. Usually, oxidizing agents are agents that are reduced at the end of a redox reaction. Then, while reducing agents are agents that are oxidized at the end of a redox reaction. And you can still remember that oxidation, in terms of electron loss and electron gain, this one is loss of electrons. Then, while this um, reduction, reduction is gain of electrons. So you can always use this code to remember it. Oil rig, oil rig. That's oxidation is loss of electrons, reduction is gain of electrons. All right. I'm pointing at somewhere now. I'll give you a code that you can use to attempt questions on identification of oxidizing and reducing agents. Keep this in mind. Now we are asked the oxidizing agent in the reaction are both. And we are all giving the, all the um, substances in the reaction we are represented in the options. Do you know what you do? Eliminate the first two options coming from the products. You can never get your oxidizing agent or your reducing agent from the products. It is only when you are giving a reversible reaction. All right? So most reactions that you are giving, it will tell you, get the oxidizing agent, reducing agent. The reaction itself is actually irreversible. This one is only proceeding in one direction. So it's obvious that the first two options you are supposed to eliminate are C being a product and D another product. So you can only obtain your oxidizing and reducing agents from the reactants. Then let me show you how you can get it. I use a code, they call it the number line representation, REMA code, number line representation, plus one, plus two, plus three. Now coming like this and coming like this, when you are going in this direction, it is oxidation. Then when you are coming like this, it is what? Reduction. How? From Na to Na+, plus, you are aware that Na has how many electrons in level? But Na+, plus, plus means it has lost one electron, so it's left with 10. So from Na to Na+, plus, that's what? A reduction. And a reduction in electron, not reduction as the 10, but reduction in electron. That's a loss of electron, meaning that sodium has lost one electron, then it's left with 10. And you can recall that from the lessons of redox reaction, you can visit my video lessons on that. Please try to check up those videos. The oxidation state of sodium here is zero, being that it's in a non-combined state. Then while the oxidation state of sodium is plus one. So from zero to plus one, if you check this number line, this code, from zero to plus one is going to this direction, zero to plus one to this direction, meaning that sodium was oxidized. That's it. Meaning it has lost electron from zero to plus one. Then what about if I say Fe2 plus to Fe3 plus? The oxidation state of ion here is plus 2. Here is plus 3. So if you want to move from plus 2 to plus 3, check the number line, the REMA code. You'll notice that from plus 2 to plus 3, it's still going in this direction. So it means that this was still oxidized. And always remember that an agent that is oxidized at the end of the redox reaction is the reducing agent. The why the agent that is reduced is the oxidizing agent. So please take on this of that. Now, we are still going to work with this our number line, but let's get this thing straight. The oxidation state of hydrogen in this um, compound is plus one. That's in the rule, oxidation number rule determination. You can check the video lesson you see there. So in most compounds, the oxidation state of hydrogen is plus one. Then oxidation state of oxygen is minus two. Then over here is zero. Then while this one is zero, then why carbon here, this compound is carbon 2 oxide, so carbon here is plus 2. Then oxygen here is minus 2. Alright? So let's confirm. For hydrogen, let's see whether there was a change in the oxidation state of hydrogen. You know, in the reactant it was plus 1. In the product it was 0. So plus 1 to 0. So plus 1 to 0 is to which direction? Let's check. Plus 1 to 0 is coming like this. So it means that the whole of this was what? Reduced. So since this substance, the whole of it was reduced, then it is what? The oxidizing agent. Yes, any substance that is reduced is the oxidizing agent. But then again, if you check using oxygen, oxygen here is minus 2, over here is still minus 2. So you can't work with oxygen because the oxidation state of oxygen did not change. But in the case of hydrogen, it changes. So of course, since it changed from plus 1 to 0, we can use only hydrogen. 
to determine if the entire substance here is the oxidizing agent. So that's how it works. So this is the oxidizing agent. Then for this one, this is zero. Zero of carbon changed in the product to be plus two. Zero to plus two is to which direction? It's going like this, zero to plus two. That's oxidation, meaning this was oxidized. And don't forget that an agent that is oxidized is the reducing agent. So this is the reducing agent. So the question is, they said, the oxidizing agent in the reaction above is, is actually water. We have done that, and then it has exposed or revealed it. So for those that will still be having issues with this, you can actually place your comments on the comment section, and I will explain further. So let's move on to the next. When a bottle of Coca-Cola is opened, bubbles of gas evolve. The gas is, uh, this one is obvious that it is CO2. Now, CO2, if you check my video lesson on the uh, oxides of carbon, then you get to know that CO2 is an oxide of carbon that is used in the making. One of its applications is that it can be used in the making of soft drinks. And that is what actually gives it its sharp, refreshing taste. All right? So CO2, which is also called carbon oxide, is that you call it carbon oxide or you call it carbon dioxide. So whichever one works. So it's actually the gas that is used. So it releases that gas when you open it. So it is C. Then question 17. The catalyst used in contact process is? The catalyst used in contact process is? First, we need to understand what contact process is. What is contact process? Now, contact process is simply a process that is used in the industrial, the industrial manufacturing, the industrial manufacturing of H2SO4, that's sulfuric acid, all right? And it has diverse steps that you can actually use. The first step is that sulfur is burnt in air, oxygen, to give sulfur oxide. Then sulfur oxide, I'm neglecting the phases of matter. Sulfur oxide is burnt in excess oxygen again to yield sulfur 6 oxide. Then sulfur 6 oxide, this, this step is known to be the most important step, the main step. And it is a reversible reaction. Now, um, this is the step that you employ the catalyst known as vanadium 5 oxide. All right? And then when this is formed, normally we want to get large quantity of H2SO4. If you dissolve this normally in water, it ought to give you what? H2SO4. But this process is discouraged. Why? Because it gives an exothermic reaction here, meaning a reaction that involves the release of enormous or large amount of heat to the surrounding. So it's not advisable to work with that. Rather, what you do is that you bring little amount of H2SO4 and you dissolve this into it. That is SO3 plus little quantity of H2SO4. But we are interested in obtaining a large amount industrial of this. So when you do that, it gives you what? H2S2O7. This substance is called oleum. Then you can easily dissolve this in water. When you do that, it becomes H2S2O7 plus H2O. So now I give you H2SO4, then 2 by balancing. Of course, the reaction is balanced. We are having 4 hydrogens, 4 hydrogens, then 2 sulfur, 2 sulfur, then 8 oxygen, then 8 oxygen. Everything is balanced. So we have gotten a large amount of it. So the catalyst that is needed for it is vanadium 5 oxide. This one is used uh, in the thermal decomposition of potassium chlorate, KClO3, potassium chlorate, in the um, in laboratory pressure of oxygen. So when you apply heat and then you work with manganese four oxide, it ends up producing KCl and oxygen gas. So that's what this one is used for. Then finely divided iron is used in harbor process in the making of ammonia. Then why nickel? Nickel is actually a catalyst that is suitable for hydrogenation reactions like the catalytic hardening of vegetable oil to yield my dream. The catalyst that is needed for it is actually nickel. Let's leave that question. We are done with it. And let's move on to question 18. Looking at question 18, question 18 is still coming from redox reaction. That is Fe2 plus plus MnO4 minus to give Mn2 plus plus Fe3 plus. Then we are asked, what is the change in the oxidation number of magnes in the reaction above, which is this reaction? So we are only interested in magnes here and magnes there. This happens to be a radical. Check the rule under oxidation number determination in one of my previous videos. 
I said that the algebraic sum of the oxidation number of elements in a radical, this obvious is a radical, but it's a group of atoms controlled by that charge. When a compound is regulated by a charge, or when a compound has a charge, it's called a radical. So if I bring this thing out, MnO4 minus a radical, the algebraic sum of the oxidation number of elements in this radical is equated to the charge on the radical. So the charge on this radical is minus one, so I'll just equate to minus one. And then, we don't know this, it's unknown. Oxygen in most compounds is minus two. So when you take the algebraic sum, x, which is unknown, plus sum, then four times minus two is minus eight, equal to minus one. So that becomes x, plus times minus is minus eight, equal to minus one. When you take light times, it becomes x equal to minus one, plus eight. And that will be plus seven. So the oxidation state of magnesium here is plus seven. Then over here, the oxidation state of magnesium, of course, since it's a simple ion, is plus two. So it means the oxidation state of magnesium changes from plus seven to plus two. So the answer is C. Then question 19. Question 19. Calcium hydroxide is added in the treatment of town water supply to now, the addition of calcium hydroxide during the treatment of water is actually to carry out two functions. The first function is to improve the taste, to improve the taste of water, and also to adjust, to adjust the pH of water. All right. So these are the two main functions of um, calcium hydroxide during water treatment process. Then, of course, the addition of chlorine, calculated amount of chlorine is to key gems. Then, while the addition of fluorine, fluorine is to prevent tooth decay. Then, while the addition of iodine is to prevent goiter. So, you should know all those additives that they are usually used in the process of treatment of water. Then, question 20. Question 20. A metal that is extracted from cassiterite is dash. Of, all, of course, um, looking at cassiterite, it's an ore. Of a metal called tin. So the um, ore of tin is called cassiterite. Cassiterite. We see have some other ores or some other metals, like in the case of uh, zinc. Now the ore of zinc is sphalerite. Sphalerite, or you can call it zinc blend. You still have other ores like the calamine. Yes, it's still for zinc too. Then for aluminium, of course, aluminium is bauxite. Bauxite, that's the ore of aluminium. Bauxite, all right. Then we also have even um, what's it called? Uranium. Uranium is actually carnotite. Carnotite. So that's the ore of uranium. Then we still have others, like we have the uh, the magnesium magnesite, and then we have quite a number. We have quite a number. But with this that we have been able to see, even iron, yeah, iron, yes, they commonly ask for iron. It's called hemite. Hemite. Why you pronounce as hematite? It's the same thing. So we still have quite a number of things to cover. So it's my hope that you've been able to comprehend everything that I've just explained. Please don't forget to go through this video over and over again so that you get insight as to scoring very high in your chemistry in the forthcoming jam 2023. I wish you guys all the best. Don't forget to, if you like the video, just hit the like button and also comment, place your comments if you have anything that is bothering you. Then share the video, invite your friends to this channel so that they can also benefit the way you are benefiting too. So I wish you guys all the best and thanks for watching.